everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today at the GT Bank Fashion Weekend 2018. This is our first masterclass, and I hope it's going to be an amazing one. Um, so the talent we have today, he's the youngest person to ever been, be on the Men's New York Fashion Week runway show. So that's a pretty big deal. He's been recognized by industry greats like Virgil Abloh of Off-White, Pierce Moss, Teen Vogue, ID, New York Times, a lot of really big names. So, ladies and gentlemen, give a resounding round of applause for Taufik Abijako. Okay, so lovely to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I'm really, really excited. I met you yesterday. I'm really, really excited to like dig into what you're doing, um, how you got there. The topic we're discussing is understanding the industry, starting out. You came up with the topic, so you'd probably be best to talk about this than me. But I'm just going to be here to like help you wing it through. Got gotcha. you. <laughs> so um, let's talk about how. Let's talk about your upbringing. Let's talk about you growing up in Nigeria, then moving to America, and kind of starting in fashion. How, how did that start? Let's yeah. talk about the how. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> um, I was born in Lagos, actually, Ajegunle, which I don't know how far it is from here. And um, I grew up in Ajangbadi, which is like the other side of Lagos. And I moved to the US early 2010. And um, you know, went to middle school, went to high school, and my junior, late junior, senior year at Albany High, I got into fashion. And I got into, I mean, my dad was a fashion designer mm -hmm. prior to that, and uh, he did traditional Yoruba garments. Although when I moved to America, I got more into streetwear, and I was like, you know, like High Beast was my second home, oh, yeah. Nobody, like all those like cool streetwear blogs, and Eventually, from that, I decided to launch Out of State, which I was supposed to launch when I was 15, although I had no financial backing, so I waited for a bit <laughs> to launch it. Okay, you talk about financial backing, and that's obviously a very big deal, because production in fashion is not cheap at all. How did you, how did you get that? Because I heard you definitely did not get that from your parents, so how yeah. did, how, where did your startup capital come from? I started with zero dollars, and I pretty much um, used the little resources I had in a way took advantage of it. So I, one day I was actually cleaning up my room and there was this white pair of white Vans shoes and I was like, hey, I can do something with this, you know, maybe sell it and you know, paint on it, sell it and use that money to fund out of state. So I painted a pair of white Vans. I wore it to school. My friends loved it. and. Um, I got my first purchase, it was like $130. And I was like, oh wait, I, if I sell 20 of these, I can make this much money. So I set up like a little big cartel website and I was like selling these shoes online and they were selling out like instantly, just like hand painted vans. And um, eventually, like down the line, I'm, I got to meet uh, Mandela, Amanda Sternberg, and she wore a pair and she posted it on Instagram. And the next day I literally like sold out my, like, my last stock. And that was like, the, you know, like kind of like one of the first early stages of financial you know, backing. backing and everything. Yeah, and yeah. I saved that money and launched out of state. For those of you who don't know, when he says Amanda, he's being very modest. That's Amanda from the movie Hunger Games. So that's not just any Amanda. <laughs> okay, so you grew up in a small city in New York called Albany. How did you go from a city where fashion is not really there. There isn't really a big fashion scene. How did you go from that to, you know, being here on the GT Bank stage and being on the New York Fashion Week stage and being recognized by all these people? Because a lot of people who are into fashion usually grew up in Manhattan or Paris or, you know, they have a very strong fashion scene around them. Yeah. You don't really find that many people who grow up, you know, kind of isolated from that who then have this 
strong presence in fashion as you do right now. So how, how, did, that, how did that happen? In a way, I'm still isolated. I actually, I still live in Albany, and I only go to like the city, Manhattan, which is like three hours away, just to work and stuff like that. Although, starting out, it was all social media, and um, I tell this story every time, but I piled up, this was about a week of research, I piled up a 200 list of editors and bloggers I could find, and just piled it all up, and sent an email blast to everyone for my very first lookbook. Not a single person got back to me, which was actually cool, because if, I feel like if they had gotten back to me, I would have gotten like, too comfy and everything. But that rejection, in a way, led to me going, OK, I have to, you know, instead of doing the chasing, I have to actually put the work in. And you know, the chasing is opposite. Like, they chase me instead. So I, I decided my friends were my best editors. I go, hey, guys. 9 p.m. tonight, I'm, at, I'm putting up my first lookbook on Twitter, and I made sure they were all online. I shot them a text, hey, if you're not on Twitter tonight, don't talk to me tomorrow. <laughs> That's literally what I did. And they all, you know, they all, they, I shared the lookbook, they all retweeted it, and the next day, one of the editors I happened to email came across it on Twitter, and um, he re posted it. Mm -hmm. It was high beast actually, and the guy, his name is Austin Boykin. Very cool dude. I'm still friends with him all that, and um, I was in class, and I got a text from my friend, he goes, hey, go on Hypebeast right now. I was like, what's going on, you know, and I told the teacher, hey, can I use the bathroom, because you can't, you can't be on your phone in class, so yeah. I went to the bathroom, and I was in the bathroom for like at least 20, 30 minutes, that's like almost all of class, <laughs> I was like, oh shit, what's going on, <laughs> and um, yeah, I found the article. So in a it. way, getting rejected by all those editors, or not getting responded to, yeah. kind of spurred you on even harder. Yeah, in a way, I think, you know, starting now, a lot of people see fashion and go, hey, I want to be on this cover, I want to be on this blog, I want to be on you know, everything. It's just like preconceived emotion everyone has. And I think that very first reje rejection, I'm glad that happened. And that pretty much inspired, uh, you know, the whole story. <laughs> okay, so when we had an earlier conversation, you spoke about your previous Nigerian upbringing. You talked about um, not growing up very comfortable. You spoke about sleeping in a room with about 10 people. And you said how that kind of um, motivated your, it, it, it kind of helped your work ethic. Can you, you know, elaborate on that? You know, I'm a typical average Lagos kid mm -hmm. who, you know, like the hustle and bustle like of Lagos and growing up in just a massive city that's like everyone wakes up every day trying to you know pretty much get a better life and seeing my dad leave very early from work my mom leaving very early from work just being surrounded by people who constantly work hard and they push you to the limit and you know I never try to be comfy because that's when you know, I start slacking so the environment inspired me, and also the story, in a way, it's personal, so I have to tell it through a brand. Okay, so a lot of you might not know this, but Taufik is actually not formally trained at all. So he's gotten where he's gotten just by, you know, sitting behind your laptop and doing a lot of homework. <laughs> so how, I want to go into the how. How did you, because producing a collection, one, isn't cheap, so you've kind of told us how, where you got that capital from, but how did you do the sketches? How did you go into production? How did you do all of that? I feel like a lot of people would be interested in knowing that, because it, it, it's, it's something to sketch, but it's yeah. another thing to actually produce it and then make a lookbook and get it recognized by the hype beast, yeah. you know? So how? That, that's also another part where I got rejected very early. So I had like a sketch, literally no description of anything, just sketches of you know, pieces I wanted to make. And I was making phone calls to like factories in the garment district in Manhattan and like different locations. And I was just showing up like uninvited, going, hey, can I get this produced? And a lot of them was like, it's impossible. First of all, they have such a high minimum and they only work with like established or brands who have a much better capital. And um, one of the last, factory who actually rejected me, I was like, okay, this guy seemed pretty cool. I would just show up the next day and not start a conversation about manufacturing the pieces 
that I want to manufacture. So I showed up the next day and go, hey, man, you know, I'm trying to figure this out and everything. And he was like, okay, I'll do this for you. We'll make the first set of samples. You have to be here, like, almost every day, you know, just like, so next time you come back, you can't just show up with a sketch. You have to actually have a detailed outline, like a spreadsheet, put together a tech bag. I was like, oh, that's easy. Honestly, I would sleep on the couch in the factory if you want me to, to be honest. So, um, and the first set of samples were made. And the season after, I showed up with a much better improved um, you know, production sheet. And ever since then, that's pretty much all, like, all I do is like, I get my hands dirty, like learn through the process. And um, yeah, that's pretty much how that started. Would you go to fashion school? No. I'm sorry, but um, yeah. I mean, you're young, you're 20, so you still have so much time to still, you know, get formally trained. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of the big schools would be dying to enroll you. So why wouldn't you go to fashion school? Not in against fashion school, but what I realized about the industry is, um, and also about life in general, like just go, going into something like doing your research ahead of time and then going into it and learning from mistakes, learning from you know rejections, learning from pretty much all sorts of failure. That's the, I learned faster that way instead of like being in a traditional school setting. And uh, you know, I guess are different. Some people need fashion skills, some people don't. And um, I just don't see the need. So you'd rather learn as you go along than learn in a classroom? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so you talked about having prior to kind of blowing up, actually <laughs> blowing <laughs> up, you stop being modest. <laughs> you spoke about um, applying to Parsons. And you still have the letter till today, but you haven't opened it. Yeah, I applied to Parsons, FIT, Pratt, and like a few other fashion school. And um, the time period between application and getting, the, and getting like an acceptance or rejection letter it was like, you know, a few months. And that was around the time I decided to launch out of state to, uh, you know, that's when I also picked up my very first retailer, which is United Arrows in Japan. And at that point, I go, okay, wait, I can just do this without actually going through the you know, technical Formal training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got the letter. I literally just like, it's actually still in my room. And I wake up to it almost every day whenever I'm sleeping home and stuff. And it's still there. And one day I'm going to open it. But I just don't know when. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't do that. I would have I, I definitely got rejected. Because I, I don't know if I did, but I definitely got rejected because I got the small letter which is like a sign of rejection also. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so you've gotten recognized by the CFDA, by you know, Virgil Abloh, um, Teen Vogue, New York Times, all these massive people in the fashion industry. And obviously your topic is starting out. You've clearly more than started out, you know? How, how, did you, how did you go from Albany to, to that place? How, what sort of, other than, yeah, you do social media, you know, Instagram, Twitter, blah, blah, blah. How did you go from, you know, high school in Albany to being in United Arrows in Japan? Uh, the best answer to that is in the way, um, I just, early on, I, I was trying to, in a way, it's like this table, and I'm trying to get accepted into a table in a way. That's how I you know early on. And I, then I realized it's not about getting accepted into that table. It's about creating your own table and people who, in a way, believe in it or people who have similar ideas or align with what you created will come along. And, and in a way, it's like imagine this ice cream cafeteria and then there's like the cool kids. Everyone is trying to go on the cool kids table. But then it's like, yeah. hey, I can create my own table. And whoever likes it, welcome, you know, everyone is welcome to sit there. That's how I, like, I approached it. So you're kind of like, cool kids, stay over there. <laughs> I'm going to make my own cool kids table right here. Yeah. And you got recognized for that. I, I guess, you know, <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Um, would you say you got where you are by luck or by talent? 
the best answer for that it would be you need a mixture of talent and work ethic to get lucky. Mm -hmm. And you just don't get lucky because you're just like at home playing video games, just chilling. And you have the talent, but without working hard and like consistently like putting out um, you know, products out there, making sure you keep the hard work, you can't get lucky. Yeah. Okay, so. I know you're not going to talk on a lot of things, on a few things that you're working on in the, in, in, in the near future, but you spoke about the Fela Kutia Stay project. Could you kind of touch on that a bit? Yeah, I can touch on it for a bit. So Fela Kutia is like my lifelong idol, and, um, and I've always looked up to Fela, and a lot of my work and projects have done when are inspired by him. And there's a current project, which is still very early on, of it, the early stages of it, and I'm glad you know I was brought on board for that. And you know, I think the launch of it should be early next year. I think mm -hmm. and it's just like a project and you know, paying tribute to Bella Kuti, who I've I've been a super fan from day yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, so we've kind of moved into the future. Let's come back to right now. Yeah. New York Fashion Week, Men's New York Fashion Week. How did that happen? What, what was the phone call? Where, like, where were you at the time when you got that phone call or that email or that letter where it's like, you know what, we want to have you on the runway? And what was that like? It was, in a way, I saw it like it was meant to be. In a way, I was like, all right, whenever it happens, it happens. You know, Written I, in the stars? Well, it was, I don't know. Like, so, um, I've, I've done a couple presentations before having my first runway, which was in, in July, and uh, just pretty much using, you know, the, just learning from the presentations I've done and go, okay, I think I'm ready now to have my first show. And um, the CFDA was very supportful. They, you know, they provided the space, they provided like any necessary backing I needed to have a successful runway show. And, you know, I actually just got a recent a or two ago about the next fashion week. And you know, that's just how you know, it operates. It's like the CFD was just very supportful. And that was about it. OK, let's talk about Head of State, which is the name of your brand. What sort of brand is it? We know it's a streetwear brand, but what's that niche that kind of separates it from you know, oh, he's trying to be like Virgil Abloh. Oh, he's trying to be like Supreme. Yeah. What makes head of state head of state? What makes it Taufik's brand and makes it stand out from, you know, everyone else who's tried to do streetwear? Because there's, there's, there's been quite a few people. Yeah. The way I, by our look on head of state, I don't approach it as this is a brand and I have to curate it like a brand. It's just more of this is my story and I'm writing a book and the very first page is like you know that, like what made me who I am in a way, and it's all about telling my story. And I hope I know there are millions of people out there who, in a way, relate to whatever story it is. And those are the people that I hope to like you know, resonate with. And it's just my story, and it's, it's an infinite page book. And whenever I'm done with it, there's definitely gonna be someone who continues it. And I consider, for example, like the two people I consider in fashion are either conversation starters or people who continue a conversation. And I hope I you know, not only start a conversation, but at the same time continue a conversation and highlight like, different stuff that make me who I am, I guess. OK, so streetwear, streetwear. Streetwear has become, it's become the new cool kids club. You know, you have the Cara Delevingne's, you have the Jordan Dunn's, you have all these people who are currently really into streetwear. You have the Kanye West, you know, everyone's kind of riding the streetwear wave. And it's kind of come to Nigeria in a way. Well, not in a way, it has come to Nigeria. You have, you have the Nigerian streetwear brands, um, the Ote kids, as they're called, the alternative kids, as they're called. So what streetwear brands are you, have you, have you seen? Which ones pique your interest? In Nigeria, I would say there's a cool brand I've been following for a bit. It's called Waffle and Cream. And you know, hopefully a lot of people have heard about it. I and think a few people know <laughs> Waffles and Cream. But yeah, it's like, no, they're pretty cool. Like, you no, know, just pretty much it's a skate brand. And they, like, for, when I actually saw the video, like 
hey, skaters in Lagos, like doing, yeah. like what I see kids in New York doing. I'm like, yo, this is so cool, and uh, all of that. And I think streetwear, it's not a wave. I don't see it as a wave or it's just a trend that's gonna start and then die out. I don't know, it's been around for decades. And I just think what, what the future of streetwear is just like what happens to any other um, side of fashion, whether it's luxury, whether it's contemporary, it's like there's an evolution to everything. And one of the recent evolutions we've witnessed in streetwear is the combination of streetwear and high fashion. Mm -hmm. But you have like, you know, a recent collaboration with like Fila and Fendi. Mm -hmm. Fila's like very street. And then you see like this Supreme and um, hopefully I get this brand. I don't know what brand it was, but it was probably Louis Vuitton, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah. And that was Kim Jones mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah. And I just think streetwear is, evolves over time. And it's not, it's never dying out. And a lot of, you know, designers actually are in a way shying away from being considered a streetwear brand or anything. But in a way, I embrace it. Like I grew up in the streets of Lagos. I, and I wasn't, you know, my friends inspired me. My friends are super into streetwear. And I think um, a t-shirt is just as important as a $10,000 gown or a $10,000 jacket. It, you can, there's so many, like it's like millions of messages you can pass on with just a t-shirt. And, that's my version of luxury, and that's how I, that's how I you know, view streetwear. Okay. So you're 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> you're young. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting a little old. I, I'll be 21 next year. You're young. <laughs> <laughs> and you obviously have a lot of time to kind of switch careers. You could turn around tomorrow and say, I, actually, I want to be an engineer. Actually, I want to be a doctor. Actually, I want to be a... Anything. Masterclass host, <laughs> but um, do you see Head of State being a passion project or do you see being like a long-term career for you? So Head of State, um, when I was 15, the idea of Head of State was actually, it wasn't fashion at first. I was super into architecture. I actually, I, was, I downloaded like a bootleg AutoCAD program and I was just super like nerdy and everything. And um, also furniture design. So it's like I did, I did all of this project and I have it saved like on the, just, like, from my file and my computer kept crashing because I was doing not only architecture, but you know, product design, furniture design and all that. And if, eventually I go, hey, what if I start a brand that actually has all of this under one umbrella, mm -hmm. which was the concept of Ed State. And fashion just happened to be the very first outlet to pass on the message. And I think down the line, there'll be you know, like a much wider range of um, products and designs I'll be putting out there. That's the future of Ed of State. Okay. Would you, are you looking into stocking in other, in other markets? Because I know you're currently being stocked in Japan. You're kind of looking into um, the States. Would you consider being stocked in Nigeria and London? Or are you trying to keep it, you know, very low-key, very small, very niche market? I would say when it comes to, like, you know, talking to retailers, I usually go with whatever feels right in a way. And um, if any retailer that offers me a, let's say, space and also like a platform to not only sell the clothes, but also to like have the message passed on along, those are the retailers I tend to align with more. And in a way, I, I don't know if that's been restricting, although I just seek to you know, make sure like that the, the message is you know, just as important as the clothes and whoever is willing to carry both of them, uh, those are the people I align with. And like it's like a few retailers, I just say, okay, I can't do this if you're not offering this or offering that. So you're very picky and very In a way, yeah. particular about who stocks the brand. Yeah. You're not, you're not all about whoever's going to make me all the money. <laughs> yeah, and it's not really about that. It's all about like who also believes in the message. And yeah. anytime I have like a, an appointment with a buyer, and you know, any buyer I have an appointment with, and it's like over a one hour long conversation, those are the guys I end up going with. Because those, you know, those are the guys who are more yeah. interested of, about the brand. And it's not about how this jacket sits in the store or anything, it's yeah. about the message. Okay, really quick, where do you see head of state in the next five years? What are you trying to do? Because I know you're about to start working on your next show. Yeah, but Already other than it. that. Where, what, what are you trying, where are you trying to take the brand? It's not, you know, nothing that's planned out, just to put it out there. Like I mentioned earlier, it's a story, it's my story, and I'm on the very first chapter, which is why uh, my 
first runway show was tied, tied to Genesis, and it's a very beginning, and I think you know, the story never ends, and um, it evolves over time. Now I'm moving on to the second chapter. So it's all about, and again, it's all about just continuous research, and the more mature I get research, like in my research process, the more mature the story gets, and also the more mature the brand as a whole gets, and I, um, I got a library membership at the Mets in the city, so I'm there almost every time. That's like when my nerdy side comes out. I'm like the Met, like digging into archive and just like referencing, referencing a lot of you know stories that's similar to mine. Like I, you know, I love like photographers like Malik Sidibe, Stoto Keita, Click Like Baby. Those are like West African photographers that, in a way, captured an era that I relate to more. And um, that's the, you know, pretty much the future of the brand. It's constant conversations and constant research and ev the evolution of that. Okay. Um, we've spoken on Virgil Abloh quite a bit, but um, when it comes to streetwear, that's kind of the streetwear god right now. Um, so you were recognized by Virgil Abloh. How did that happen? And what, how did that make you feel? Virgil is cool. Like, I guess, He's like, cool. yeah. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? Um, I don't know. Everything, everything was just organic in a way. I was just this kid, just you know, posting stuff on Twitter, and I think it was for my very, f my first big um, media post was with the New York Times did a profile about the brand, and the next day or some, um, one of Virgil's close friends, Tremaine. His name is Tremaine, and he came across and posted on Twitter, like all caps, like I need to meet this kid right now. And I just had like people like patting me. I'm like, wait, what's going on? Like, what's what's happening? And you know, he, you know, reached out, going, hey, killing it, the future, all that stuff. And you know, it's cool, like getting you know such recognitions, considering, like I said earlier about creating your own table and people who not only see and believe in it and who um, align with it, you know, they come along, and that's, that's how that went. Okay, that's awesome. So we're going to give the audience a chance to ask questions. Not yeah. too many, because we have about 15 minutes. So the floor is open. So hi. Hi, how are you doing? You look good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so first, I want to ask you, are you actually wearing your brand right now? Say again? Are you wearing your brand right now? On um, the pants, yeah. I actually rarely wear out of state. That's, I only wear it when I'm like at home chilling. And okay. I pull out the sweatpants and the t-shirt, okay. cozy up, but yeah. And I'm wearing the pants. So the real question actually. Um, my question is this. You said you grew up in a family whereby your parents are the one, your dad was into fashion, but you were a bit nerdy growing up. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So you said you were into architecture and furniture more before you discovered fashion, that you really loved fashion. So this was my question. In all that process, which uh, brands, which brands really inspired you? What people did you, did you look at like, oh, I, 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 I love uh, Kanye West, the way he dresses, I <laughs> or I loved, so which brands did you really, which people inspired, inspired you? me? And the designs um, you make? I would say, there's no specific brand I came across and go, oh my God, this is so cool, let me, you know, let me do this or anything. I w it, it was more, it was a very natural process, you know, like, I was designing art, you know, like, you know, I made a mall like on that program. I was like, you know, doing free furniture stuff. And I was like, oh, let me try out fashion. Let me see how I can portray this message through that lens of a fashion designer. And, you know, just like, first of all, I consider myself a storyteller first and then a fashion designer last. And you know, with all due respect to all the fashion designers out there and people who like actually, you know, go to fashion school, take their time and everything. And it was all about telling a story, and fashion just happens to be another form of telling that story. I hope that answered your question, by the way. <laughs> no problem. Any more questions? Okay, there. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, 
voice. Okay, I just want to ask. You say you make illustrations. So do you have a team that makes the clothes after drawing your illustration, or you make them yourself? Just, and how do you start with the illustration and everything? When I, when I started out, I, you know, I was a kid running around the garment district with like four suitcases, doing um, you know, fabric sourcing, everything all on my own. And eventually, like, now I'm like pretty lucky. I have like a team and everything. And we, uh, you know, I do the sketch, and I'm always, you know, I'm always there, and I do the sketch, submit it, and um, you know, we reach out to the factory, and you know, they take care of everything. I've been privileged enough to to have such a very supportive team. We need to change the topic of the masterclass. It shouldn't be starting up because you're clearly not starting up. No, I'm still starting now. I'm still like, you know, I'm, it's a very, it's literally like not that many people. It's just me and my friends. Like even yeah. my first show was. Just me and my friends, and you know, they were running backstage. It's just like literally a show by a kid for the kids, mm -hmm. ran by kids, and that's how you know I work best with people I'm more comfortable with, and people who understand me as a person. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Um, hi, oh. Tofik. Um, I'm very happy to hear your story. Um, it's very inspiring. Now, I have a couple of questions, but let me just stick to one. Maybe later I'll tweet you and ask it. Now, the question is, you said something about um, not going to um, the fashion, a fashion school, and you did all the researches and all the trainings, hands-on, trying to study yourself. And Now, the, the point here is, um, how, what's the role of mentoring? Because one of the reasons, mentoring, one of the reasons why we go to fashion school is to understand better what the fashion, how, what is happening in the fashion industry amongst the things, but you did it yourself. So I want to know how, how you balance mentoring and teaching or learning via, the, via um, the internet or whatever medium you use in learning. I don't know if you get my question. Yeah, um, I think the best answer for that will be the guys at the factory I work with, those are my teachers. and. They pretty much like go, hey, this is it, right here, go do your homework. It's the same thing as like, you know, a school setting. Your, your parents tell you, hey, do your homework. Your teachers tell you, do your homework. And I happen to have like, you know, those are, those are my teachers. And those are the people who, in a way, go, hey, this is what you have to get done. Go do the homework. And I also, you know, teach myself in a way by, you know, like I have an access to a smartphone. So I can easily, like every answer is on Google, literally. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Hi. Hey. Um, I have a question. It's how and what helped you put together your brand aesthetics? Say again? How and what helped you put, to put together your brand aesthetics? Um, is it some sort of personal sense of style? Or did you experience some emotional roller coaster at a point that helped you channel that into a definite, uh, you know, brand aesthetics for yourself? When it comes to aesthetic, I would say, you know, it's just you. It's just me being me. That's literally it. Like, I just put stuff that I like and um, stuff I relate to. Like I said, it's my personal story. And, you know, I don't consider my personal story an aesthetic. <laughs> that's kind of weird. But that's pretty much how I went about it. I, I, you know, I go, okay, let me tell my story and the visuals also have to represent that. It's just as important. That's how I went about, in a way, developing an aesthetic. Can we give the lady at the, the middle over there? Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Thank hey. you. Hi. Your lecture has been insightful. Um, you're Nigerian, so my question is, even though you said you stalk mostly in New York and Japan, do you see yourself opening a store in Nigeria? Anytime soon. Opening a store or stocking in a store? Yeah, stocking a store or something. This is a store I like. It's called, um, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Alara. Alara. Yeah, it's a pretty cool store. Like, and also, like, I, like, I haven't been in it yet, although I've seen images, and it looks like, in a way, they curate it. So the, each brand story is like, you, know, you walk in and you can understand right away. And those are the stores I, I tend to like, you know, align with more, and those are... If there's anyone who has a connect to that, hit me up after. But yeah, in the future, maybe Lagos, maybe not. And again, it depends on who tells the story, the way I want the story to be. So. 
Anyone else? So you said your father was into fashion designing. What aspects? Uh, my good dad afternoon. was. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> my dad worked um, strictly with traditional garments like Ankara, um, blouse, and um, he did you know, yoga bar ga garments. And he actually he doesn't design anymore. He used mm -hmm. to. When he moved to the U.S., he, like you know, he pretty much stopped. And yeah, he was more into the traditional wear. Okay, I have several questions. Okay, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> so the Amanda lady, the, um, the Hunger Games lady, yes. How did she see your design? Oh, that was just, I, I, had a, I have a friend called Miles who was a film director and um, he was shooting his very first featured film in Albany. And um, I, I, I just happened to be on set and Amanda and a few others were like on it and no, we just like conversations and just people like being interested in what everyone else, everyone else does. And, you know, made her a pair of shoe. And then ever since then, she's been like very supportive. It's funny because when I launched out of state, the very first order I got on a t-shirt was from her. And I'm, I'm like, all right, it's just cool, I guess. <laughs> okay, can we take two, just two more questions? We have five more minutes, so two more questions and we have to round up. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, you spoke about putting description on your sketches. Please, can you like elaborate on that? Uh, are you talking about the early stage or just? Yeah, the early stage. Yeah, the early stage was literally just I go, I visualize in my head, hey, this is what I want done, and I sketch it. Although, like, I didn't put the detail in, as in the dimension of the pocket, how I want the fit to be, like, none of that. And that's like the like that's what makes a garment, just all that you know the detail in it, all of it. But I just go, hey, I want to make a jacket, sketch it, <laughs> submitting. Hey, can you guys figure this out? It's not. It's actually not like that. That's not how it works. And I learned that right away. Okay, one okay. last question. I'm uh, so sorry. <laughs> we only have time for one last question. Hello, Taufik. Hey, how you doing? Nice story. Inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, you said something about being more interested in people who. Um, key into your brand and who understands your message more than those who get the dollars rolling in. So what exactly are these messages you're trying to pass? And I mean, how far do you think that audience has imbibed and understood that story? So can you repeat the last part? Yeah. How far, how much, to what extent do you think that that audience has understood and imbibed that message you've been trying to pass? Did you, add, could, yeah. could you come again, sorry? Okay, so you said, you are more interested in people who are interested in your story and the okay. messages you're trying to pass. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay, so to what extent has, I mean, that audience understood that story? Can you tell um, how, to what extent they've imbibed that story and the message you've been trying to pass and what that message is exactly? Do you what, understand the question? I mean, I, un I understand that last sentence. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> And um, I would say the message is more about raising awareness and highlighting the stuff I grew up in. So I grew up, I grew up growing up in Lagos, um, working well off in a way, and I was ex also exposed early on to corruption. I was exposed you know, very early on to like social and political issues. And I, you know, just being in that environment and then moving to the U.S., being a, you know, an African American, I would say, in the U.S., and um, you know, being exposed to the social issues there, the political issues. Right now, it's like insane. Like, I mean, we all watch TV. We all know what's going on right now. And also, you know, centuries and you know, generations of oppression in the U.S. And actually, I had it like a day. My mom called me in and go, "Hey, before you go to a store, make sure you don't have your hoodie on." And even my my little brother is not allowed to have toy guns. And all that, just been exposed to that very early on, and you know that's my life. And I know a lot of people also go through the same thing. And all I have to be, you know, out, you know, just out of respect for everyone, is to be as honest as possible, and also be as transparent as possible. And that's what the story is about, pretty much. Okay, I'm sure we have a ton more questions, but we're coming to the end of the session. I hope everyone enjoyed this. But before we go, Tafik, thank you so much for coming here. Well, thank you, sure. everyone, for coming to the GT Bank Fashion Weekend. But everyone is looking very dull. 
Can we please, please, please give a round of applause for GT Bank Fashion Weekend 2018? Can we make the people standing outside excited to come in for the next class? So before we go, Taufik and I want to do something. <laughs> we want to put you on our Instagram story, if you don't mind. So let's make the people on Instagram jealous that they're not here. And let's make the people who are coming in for the next class excited to come in here. So in three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope everyone had an amazing time. We'll see you in the next class.